So it's tough. We hear arguments all the time or things that sound like arguments, and it turns out they're not. They're actually really bad mistakes in reasoning, right? So hopefully through our previous lecture and this lecture and lectures to follow, you'll get accustomed to what you know common fallacies are are out there and how we can pay attention to them so that when people use them, we realize that, well, shoot, there's not really a reason to believe a conclusion here. Conversely, maybe you can use these to convince people of your point of view and to move them to act in ways that uh, you would like them to, hopefully for good reasons and not for nefarious ones. So remember from last time we talked about how pseudo reasoning, right? Fake reasoning leads to fallacies and fallacies are mistakes in reasoning. So we looked at a video uh, not too long ago where it highlighted the uh, Nigerian 419 scam where uh, it's a famous scam where people are fooled into giving a certain amount of money for the promise of a larger sum back. And what we can say is that there were some fallacies involved here people convince themselves of things to be true. Two common fallacies with regards to fooling oneself are rationalizing and wishful thinking. My wife is going to love this battery charger I bought her for her birthday. She can really use it. She'll be glad I spent the night out drinking. I'm giving her some personal space. Both of these are examples of rationalizing. This is when we lie to ourselves about our real reasons for believing or doing something. So we know that um, uh, we want something done because we want it. We know that uh, there's something that happens um, or we want something to happen because we want it. But instead of acknowledging that, we come up with a reason why it should be done. Right? This is rationalizing. Uh, wishful thinking is a close cousin. This is thinking something is true simply because we want it to be true. So we're not trying to convince us of a reason beyond our own desire here. That's, that's different, right? That's rationalizing. Here, we have a claim and we believe the claim to be true just because of our desire for the claim to be true. Um, so, of course, I believe a bank in Nigeria has millions of dollars that I inherited from a distant relative that I've never heard of or met. Okay? So, the only reason to believe the claim to be true is because we want it to be true. So, we're not coming up with a reason to believe something to be true. Right? The only reason we have, the only, uh, the only reason we have for believe it to be true is simply our desire for it to be true. So hopefully that distinction between rationalizing and wishful thinking is obvious, right? Rationalizing, you make up a reason to believe something is true, when in fact you know the reason is just because you want it to be true. Wishful thinking is the only reason to believe it's true is because you want it to be true. So very similar, right? Hopefully you see the difference. A special type of wishful thinking is denial. Oh, professor, I didn't miss that many questions on my midterm. So they're denying the, the truth, right, of something. It's a form of wishful thinking. They, they convince themselves they, they didn't miss that many questions. They don't give themselves a reason. They don't make one up, right? They're not rationalizing. It's just denying the truth of it. Now, one thing that's really important to note is the difference between wishful thinking and optimism, because they can be oftentimes confused for one, uh, for one another, but they're dramatically different. So if we take a look at wishful thinking, remember, it's believing something simply because we want it to be true. And oftentimes, this is just denying reality. Optimism, on the other hand, is recognizing that positive perspectives positive possibilities and uh, positive outcomes are possible, right? So you're not saying that this will happen or this has to be the case just because you want it to be true. You are recognizing that the future is open, that you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So just as something bad could happen tomorrow, something great could happen tomorrow. That's optimism. 
it's fully embracing all the possibilities of reality. So to give you a, an illustration, you know, oftentimes people use a, uh, a glass of water as a metaphor or way of illustrating optimism, right? Optimism is saying that the glass is half full. Uh, pessimism is often thought of as focusing on the fact that the glass is half empty. Uh, wishful thinking is believing that there is a leprechaun in your glass of water uh, just because you want it to be true that the leprechaun has some gold for you, right? That is not optimism. That is wishful thinking. You believe something to be true because you want it to be true. You take a look at the glass of water. It's not that you want to believe the glass of water is half full. It actually is half full. It's a perspective on what you are experiencing. All right. Hopefully you notice that difference because that's kind of an important difference. With optimism, you have you can gain energy to move. You can gain energy to do something, uh, to take some action in your life, right? Wishful thinking, you can imagine that you set yourself up for failure. You set yourself up for disappointment in the future. Uh, and if you try to be optimistic and you tend towards wishful thinking, I mean, that could be painful for you. If you remember that, wish, that optimism is just about being open to positive possibilities, then no matter whether or not those possibilities come to fruition in the future, it gives you motivation and energy to move forward. Okay. So uh, there are also various social types of fallacies, fallacies uh, that stem from human beings designed biologically to be social animals who want to be part of groups. So people can use that built in desire to make us believe certain claims um, because we are social creatures. So we'll take a look at peer pressure and group think. Of course you should sniff glue bottles. Everyone else is doing it. You should take a drink with us. Don't you want to be part of the in crowd? Can you see the commonality here? Right. The commonality is that the speaker is trying to get us to do or believe something by appealing to our Fear of being excluded from the group. Okay, so peer pressure is related to fear, fear of exclusion. So you can think of it as having a negative connotation. Peer pressure is about not wanting to be excluded. Groupthink has a, a similar, um, uh, preys on the similar psychology, but on the positive side of the spectrum. Uh, it's trying to get us to do or believe something by appealing to our pride of membership. So I could say something like, the new Steve Jobs movie was very good. How could you hate it? Didn't you go to De Anza? Right? Appealing to the idea that, you know, Steve Jobs went to De Anza for a couple of semesters. Uh, so you are a student at De Anza. So the speaker here is trying to appeal to your pride of membership, right? About how good it is to feel part of the group in order for you to believe something they want you to believe. Okay. A special type of group think is nationalism, where people try to convince others to believe a claim appealing to their pride of their nation, pride of their country, right? So something like, um, uh, you know, it's if somebody says you should do this or do that because it's it's American to do it, right? That appeal or whatever nationality, it, it it's American to do this, so we should do it. We should believe it because it's American to believe it. Well, that's appealing to our pride of membership to. Uh, our country, right? Again, it's not a reason to believe a claim. None of these are reasons to believe a claim, right? All they're doing is, is appealing to our psychology to try to convince us and move us to a certain conclusion. Um, back after 9-11, uh, lots of people were feeling a sense of national pride um, to the extent that people were banning French fries, right? Because they had the word French in front of them. Um, without any real reason to ban fries. You know, you can ban fries for lots of reasons. It costs too much, it's bad for your health, it's, but because they're un-American, right? it's a type of nationalism. Um, so let's, let's try to summarize these so you get a good uh, sense of the difference. Remember, peer pressure stems from exclusion, so fear of exclusion, and think is about pride of membership, wanting to stay in versus being afraid of being kicked out, okay? Uh, obviously, when people are using rhetoric 
uh, of this type in uh, conversation and dialogue and debate. They'll use both, usually at the same time. So let's go ahead and practice the uh, fallacies that we've uh, learned so far. Go ahead and take a look uh, at exercise 6-1 in your text and try to do numbers 2, 3, 6, 8, and 9. What sorts of fallacies do you see the passage uh, using? And then take a minute, do that, come back, and then we'll go through the answers together. Hopefully you've taken that minute to take a look at the exercises. Uh, number 2 uses wishful thinking. Number 3 uses argument from pity. So hopefully you can notice that they're trying to elicit pity. Number six also uses the argument from pity. Uh, number eight, again, depending on how you want to read the passage, it can be thought of as being uh, using peer pressure or groupthink. And then number nine, hopefully you recognize that they're trying to elicit envy from somebody. Okay? So there's also a group of fallacies that um, refer to cultural traditions. Um, we refer to things that people have done in the past as justification for what we should do or believe in in the future. So the first we'll take a look at is argument from popularity or appeal to popularity. Everybody believes it, so it must be true. You probably heard this many times where the argument is, hey, come on, everybody believes this is fact, so it must be true. As if every time the mass or the group believes something, Right? It's true. Well, we obviously know that's not the case. We used to think the earth was flat. Lots of people used to think this. Um, but just because lots of people think it doesn't believe it, doesn't make it true. Right? Uh, it could be that lots of people are wrong. It could be that many of us are, are um, misinformed. So it's not an actual reason to believe it. Right? Appealing to popularity just appeals to how everyone has a certain viewpoint. It doesn't appeal to actual evidence to support that viewpoint. Uh, second is argument from common practice. So everybody does it, so it must be right. Okay. So it appeals to the idea that here, all these people kind of do it, so that action, that behavior must be something that we should do too, that we should emulate. Uh, but just imagine if everybody in your neighborhood just ignores all the stop signs. It doesn't really justify that you ignore the stop sign too, right? And it's just an appeal to um, conforming to your, your group, your culture. Argument from tradition. We've always done it, thought about it that way, okay? So here we're looking at a line of tradition. And because that line shows a certain type of behavior or a certain belief, therefore, we are justified in doing it that way. We're justified in believing it, too. Okay? So you can think of lots of traditions that we now think as being outdated or as being um, prejudiced or as being um, immoral. But because everyone did it in the past within our community, uh, they use that as justification for doing it now. You know, for the longest time, athletics, certain sports, major league sports uh, associations didn't allow African Americans to participate. And the argument was, hey, we, we haven't allowed them to participate, so it's, we're justified in not allowing them to participate now, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a fallacy. It's not an actual reason why African Americans should not be allowed to participate in major um, athletic uh, events, right? It's not an actual reason. It's just appealing to the fact that this is how our culture has done it through tradition. Um, so when we hear people discuss issues, I, I would caution you whenever they appeal to tradition or common practice or popularity to ask yourself, "What? wait a minute, are they actually giving a reason why we shouldn't do this or why we should believe that? Or are they just uh, appealing to all these other people and what they do as if, you know, all your friends jumped over a bridge, should you jump too? Is that justification for you jumping? Um, all your friends um, decided to skip school. Is that 
justification for allowing you to skip school. Well, no, it's just an excuse. <laughs> um, uh, here we're at our company. Uh, we've always manufactured our widgets this way. So we're justified in continually manufacturing our widgets like this in the future. Well, you know, if that were the case, then there'd never be innovation. There'd, uh, people would never do anything different or anything new or be more productive um, with, their, with their manufacturing processes or come up with new inventions or products, right? So appeals to popularity and common practice and tradition um, are pretty common. And I just ask that you be aware of that and see if there's any other reasons provided to believing or doing something. Now, with that said, if somebody justifies a belief with a cultural fallacy, does it make the belief wrong? Well, no, not necessarily, right? You can imagine that uh, there are things people have believed for a long time that we hadn't had proof for, uh, and uh, just because the argument is, hey, everybody believed it, so that's why we believe it. Everybody did it, so that's why we do it. We've always done it that way. Our people have always done it this way. Therefore, this is what we should do it now. If that's the only argument, it doesn't mean what they're saying is not true. It doesn't mean that what they're saying is false. It's just that they don't really give us reasons to do it. They don't actually give us evidence to believe it. But it could very well be true, right? So one thing to keep in mind. Uh, there are distraction fallacies. So you can be in the midst of conversation and somebody could avoid the issue by bringing in a topic or changing the direction of the conversation, right? So uh, the, this is the common one is a red herring, also known as a smoke screen. A red herring is bringing a topic into conversation that distracts from the original point. And a smoke screen is the same thing, really, the same um, fallacy is just that the smoke screen is often more involved. Uh, it's often used when referring to an argument with complicated or multiple distractions. So the idea of red herring is uh, herring is a fish, and if you know anything about fish, they're kind of smelly, and you throw a fish in the middle of a conversation, and all the attention goes to the fish. So this is the idea of a red herring: is that sometimes if people want to change the direction of the conversation, they'll, they'll introduce a new topic or they'll answer a question in a way that goes in a different direction and then all of a sudden we're going down a road of discussion that really has nothing to do with the original issue. Yeah, so this is a red herring. Bringing to a topic and into a conversation, uh, bringing a topic into a conversation that distracts from the original point. Wife, I saw you cheating on me with your secretary. Husband, how dare you follow me? You notice the red herring? The initial issue is about cheating on uh, his wife with the secretary. The husband does not address the issue, does not address whether or not he was cheating, but instead changes the issue to how dare you follow me. Okay, so that's a red herring. It's uh, bringing into uh, a topic that changes the conversation, distracts from the original issue. Um, it happens in politics all the time. You watch a news program where a interviewer is asking a, a politician or a political candidate questions, and the candidate doesn't want to directly answer the question, so they they say something that sounds related, but actually goes in a different direction than the intended question. Reporter, how do you plan to fix the economy? So the issue is uh, how how to fix the economy. And uh, the politician says, my opponent has no experience balancing a budget. So notice that the politician does not address fixing the economy. The politician changes direction and draws the attention to um, uh, problems with their opponents. This is a really common usage of a red herring in political debate and political discussion. Uh, politicians um, know that certain people are... Um, uh, it can stir emotional buttons with the constituents. So just bringing up a politician's name, a particular political candidate, a political government official can stir the emotions of people. So they just raise the name, say the name, and instead of actually addressing the issue. So smokescreen, as we said, is, 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 is a red herring, but it uh, usually deals with more complex discussion, more complex dialogue. 
So the Tobacco Institute had this ad in the USA Today. We challenge the American Cancer Society to clean up the air in its smoke-free offices. We are willing to bet there isn't much cigarette smoking at American Cancer Society offices. But according to a recent study from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, cigarette smoke also wasn't the problem in 98% of 203 buildings reported to have indoor air problems. Indoor air inspections resulting from worker complaints typically find viruses, fungal spores, uh, fungal, yeah, fungal spores, bacteria, gases, closed fresh air ducts, and ventilation systems in need of maintenance. Okay, so think about the general issue that the tobacco industry has to deal with, and it's the issue of the... Um, uh, how dangerous their products are for people, how tobacco can lead to cancer. So, I mean, that's usually the issue, is how bad tobacco is for people. Instead of addressing the issue, instead of talking about how bad tobacco is for people who use it, they change direction, right? They don't address that issue. And instead, they talk about how buildings have air quality problems that have nothing to do with tobacco. That does not change the fact of whether or not tobacco could cause cancer, right? They're just pointing out that there are other sorts of air problems within buildings. Again, has nothing to do with whether or not tobacco causes cancer or whether or not tobacco is a problem for people that use it. They completely ignore that issue. Right? This is an example of a smokescreen. Lastly, we'll take a look at the fallacy Two wrongs make a right. And this is when thinking wrong behavior by someone else excuses wrongful behavior by you. You did this to me, so I can do this to you. This was done to me, so I then have, um, uh, am justified in doing this to others, right? So here's some examples of when one wrong is done to an individual. Your party was too noisy and kept me up last night, so I set fire to your car. Do you notice that the speaker is justifying their poor behavior by pointing to the other person's poor behavior? So the idea here is that you setting fire to somebody's car is pretty much just wrong. <laughs> it doesn't really matter whether or not somebody did a wrong to you. It is wrong. You can't justify that wrong by appealing to a previous wrong. Right? It's not a reason to justify your wrong. It doesn't make your wrong right. Second type, one to another. You took my parking space, so I robbed your mother. So wrong was done to this individual, and he uses that to justify wronging somebody else. Again, hopefully you notice that this does not show, this is not an actual argument for why you are justified in robbing somebody's mother. Um, yeah, no reason is given to justify that act. So instead, what they do is they justify it by just saying, I was wrong, so then I can wrong somebody else. Hopefully you realize that just because somebody wrongs you does not make it just that you wrong somebody else. And a third type is a future-based justification. The store gave me $10 in change instead of one. I'm not giving it back because they wouldn't give it back to me if I, make, if I made this mistake. So notice they're justifying it based upon what might happen in the future, right? So because I think they would wrong me tomorrow, I am justified in the wrong I am doing now. Hopefully you can see that a wrong that may or may not happen tomorrow or even a wrong that happened yesterday or a wrong that's happening right now does not justify a wrong that you do right now, okay? Uh, hopefully it makes sense why these are all referred to as fallacies. So let's go ahead and practice a little bit more by taking a look at exercise 6-2, numbers 23589. What sorts of fallacies do you see in these passages? Take a brief moment and then come back. And we'll take a look at the answers together. Okay, I hope you had a, a moment to take a look at those exercises. Let's take a look at number two. Hopefully you recognize that this is a fallacy of common practice, right? Everybody does it, so we should, we're justified in doing it too. 
Number three, this is a example of rationalizing. All right, they're they're coming to a belief about some a, about a claim, and it's obvious that they don't really believe it; they're just making it up. Um, number five is a red herring. Hopefully, you see a a change in topic there. Number eight, again, is rationalizing, and number nine is appeal to popularity. Right? Okay. So when we come back, we'll take a look in our next video on the most common fallacy, and that's the ad hominem fallacy, where instead of providing reasons to believe a claim, we just attack a speaker of a claim. We attack a speaker or a believer of a claim and say, hey, because this person is such and such of a person, therefore you should believe what I believe about it. All right, I'll see you then.